Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Probably first off what I'll say is just check that you're on mute for the initial part. So just make sure that your camera's off and you're on mute uh, before we get started. All right, so tonight is session two in our series and the topic is the role of GPs and other health professionals in identifying and managing children with speech, language and communication difficulty. So my name is Charles Broadfoot and I'm one of the professional development officers with Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the first peoples and traditional custodians of all the lands in which we are meeting on tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend my welcome to any Aboriginal people who may be joining us online too. So just to let you know, tonight's session is being recorded and the recording and the slides will become available from tomorrow in our education library on our website. So to access these, you just head to our homepage, the phn.com.au and click on the education tab. So we will be using Slido tonight for poll questions and the session evaluation survey. So we definitely would love your participation. So you can access Slido by just um, on your phone, tablet, or in a second screen on your computer. So you just head to slido.com, so that's S-L-I-D-O, and enter our event code SLC2. So that stands for speech, language, communication, and then the number two. If you open up your chat box, you'll notice that I've posted the direct link there. So you can just click that if you wanna access via your computer. Um, it'll just ask you for your name as an authentication. So if you just click, um, just enter your name and then cl click into there, you'll come to a poll section. So that's where we'll be launching the polls. Um, I can give instructions again for this, but um, yeah, it's all in the chat box as well. So slido.com and our event code is SLC2 and we would really love you to participate. Just a note as well, once you're actually in there and you vote in our poll questions, um, they are anonymous. So our panelists don't know who you are if you do a response that might be incorrect, but there's no incorrect responses, of course. So um, we definitely encourage you to ask any questions that you have tonight at any time throughout. It is a panel format, so you know we would love your interaction. So there's a few ways that you can interact with our panelists. You can do so by clicking the raise hand function. So this is a button that'll either be in the top right hand corner um, of your screen in your Microsoft Teams window, or for some of you, it may be down the bottom in the middle and like a little panel. So it's a little uh, smiley face with a hand. So if you click that, it'll highlight you and then our facilitator will invite you to unmute and ask your question. Um, of course, alternatively, you can just type your questions in the chat box, uh, which we'd love for you to do, and our facilitator will then read these out for our uh, panellists. Um, as mentioned, there will be a short evaluation survey um, at the end, and this will also be in Slido via the same link. I will post this at the end um, and let you know when it's ready to be filled out. Um, can I ask you to please complete this to accurately um, capture your attendance, especially our GPs, so I can... Um, I can uh, match it up and make sure I upload your CPD points for RSAGP or ACRAM. Um, and of course, the survey is an opportunity for you to give us feedback. We're always looking to how we can improve our sessions and also helps us to inform future topics that you are interested in. So it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's facilitator, Dr. Joanne Wood. Jo is a general practitioner with Hunter New England Local Health District and the Headspace Youth Service. She's also a clinical editor with Hunter New England Health Pathways Program and the clinical director of Hunter Primary Care. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. I'll hand over to you, Joe, to introduce the session and tonight's panel of speakers. Thanks, Charles. It is my great pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you very much for having me too, Charles. Um, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel members Right now, here we go. Um, we have Dr. Mary Classen, uh, all the way from over in Western Australia. Give us a wave, Mary, so we know it's you. She's an experienced speech pathology researcher and clinician and is cur a current academic staff member of the Curtin University School of Allied Health. Um, Mary's expertise is 
um, very apt for tonight's topic and her research focuses on improving quality of life for people with communication and feeding difficulties. We're also very lucky to have Jessica Warren, who is a senior psychologist and manager with psychology and specialist services at the Department of Communities and Justice. Um, her particular area of interest lies in the treatment of trauma in the early childhood period. So we're very fortunate to have her expertise here tonight. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Kate Headley, who is the driving force of tonight's panel, thank you, um, has worked, worked extensively as a senior speech pathologist in the disability sector across New South Wales. And between 2018 and 2021, she worked as part of the Lynx Trauma Healing Service, so providing trauma-focused interventions to children living in out-of-home care. So thank you very much, everybody, for um, joining us tonight. We're looking forward to hopefully a... Um, a really useful conversation around um, identifying and managing um, early speech language and communication difficulties that we may come across in our general practice setting. But I know that we've got a, a great range of participants tonight in different allied health um, areas. So we're looking forward to all everybody's perspectives. So the objectives of what we're sort of hoping to achieve by having our panel discussion tonight is that we can explore um, the role and perspectives of different medical and allied health professionals around the importance of speech pathology referral, to identify the impacts of untreated speech, language and communication difficulties across all areas of development, and discuss the high incidence of speech, language and communication difficulties in children who have experienced family and domestic violence. So to set the scene, we're going to get all of our brains engaged with a quiz. No, just joking, it's just a poll. Um, so hopefully you've all got that Slido link. And this is where I'm going to potentially, hopefully be able to contribute. Has everyone, here we go. You've got some nods. So Charles, are you listening? Do I, sorry, do we have to wait a period of time before we can see the, can I get? Yep. Okay, so, there you go. Yep, so if you if you also answer, Joe, uh, once you answer, everyone will be able to see the percentage of responses. Wonderful. Okay, Kate, did you want to take it from yeah. here for the discussion? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so we, I mean, I'm just watching those Slido poll results come in as people are entering their thoughts. and. Really interestingly, we're seeing that people feel overwhelmingly that really big numbers of children in Australia aren't developmentally on track with their communication milestones at the start of school. So that is certainly what the data does suggest as well. We have some really clear cut data that comes from the Australian Early Development Census that was published in 2018. And that shows that 22.7% or one in five of Australians, Australia's children are not developmentally on track with their communication skills at school entry. So we are talking really, really significant numbers. Um, and obviously we would expect that some of that would cluster in different communities. So where we can say the average across Australia is over one in five students, we know that in some communities, it's much, much higher than that. And I guess as a speech pathologist, it's particularly worrying to know that the research is telling us that children who start behind with their language skills on school entry don't actually catch up. So, and I think it's important to put that out there straight away at the start of tonight, because I do think it's a bit of a misconception in the community. And, you know, obviously my role talking with families and carers, a lot of parents would say to me, you know, I've just always assumed that, like I knew that they weren't talking like their friends, but I just thought they'd get to school and they'd catch up. But actually the research is telling us children don't. And that's because oral language skills are directly related to our acquisition of reading skills, our literacy development. <clears throat> so if we start school not having age appropriate language skills, we're immediately behind the ball in terms of maintaining our academic progression alongside our peers. 
Um, and there's also real social uh, repercussions, obviously, for that as well for students. So I think it's a pretty good starting point and interesting for me to see in the Slido results that, you know, the majority is pretty bang on. People picked 20 to 30 percent and that's exactly where the data lies. Thanks, Kate. That's a good opener for our case. Um, which I'll just read out for us now. So Chloe um, presented for an appointment in general practice with her mum following concerns about some skin sores. She's two and a half years old um, and her physical examination identified what appeared to be typical of a dermatitis that had been a bit scratched and subsequently infected. Throughout the appointment, mum demonstrated a flat affect and a low mood and Chloe appeared to mirror this. She was quiet and unemotive. She demonstrated minimal changes in her demeanour with efforts to engage her in banter. And on one occasion, only on one occasion, she smiled slightly during play with the stethoscope. Mm. That's really interesting, Joe, because we've kind of got quite limited information there, haven't we? And so I guess as the GP, I'm wondering from your perspective, what would be the other things that you would immediately be wanting to find out about? That's a good question, Mary. And of course, you know, <laughs> in the, the luxury of the moment, I can have a bit of time to think about it. But mm. um, find that it's a good way to try and establish rapport too, to do a bit of a, um, a pregnancy history, sort of find out how the pregnancy went, how the birth went, if there was any complications for Chloe after she was born, then get we can sort of go on and ask about developmental milestones and how they have been met. Um, I'd also want to sort of do a bit of a dive in and see if there's been any medical problems, any hearing troubles that she's had. She's had lots of courses of antibiotics. Get a sense of, um, uh, you know, if they've tried different medications for different things, you know, fishing around for, for solutions to problems, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so I'd uh, use it as a time to collect a bit more history. Just um, with your sort of perspective, is there any extra sort of things that you'd be looking for or interested in with this sort of case? Um, yeah, I, I think I'd be really interested in to know a little bit more about what was what's sort of happening for mum. So mm -hmm. is this presentation really typical for her? Is this her having a bad day um, or a bit of an off day? Is it been a particularly tricky day with Chloe? Um, just more context, I think, around that. Um, I, th I think the kind of important thing to know is that, like, I, I'm not trying to minimise that, but I think sometimes, you know, I'm a mum and <laughs> everyone has um, tough days with their kids, but it's about, um, uh, I guess, the longevity of that mood um, and how long that's sort of been going for. Um, the important thing to kind of know is that research does sort of tell us that um, mum's mental health has a direct impact um, for Chloe um, and that, uh, you know, if mum presents with uh, mental health issues um, and psychopathology, then that places Chloe at greater risk of psychopathology and poor functioning um, later on um, and, and, you know, currently. Um, and, and I guess that's because of the impact on of that on her attachment. Um, so I, I, that's why I think it's really important to know a bit more context around that. Um, we know that mums that have, you know, uh, depression, they often have uh, reduced responsiveness, um, affection, there's a lack of reciprocal interaction, some increased punitiveness, which results in that um, insecure attachment. And that could be what is what we're sort of seeing in front of us um, in this appointment. Um, but equally, it could just be we're having a bit of a bad day. Um, uh, the other thing too is that the kind of the impact for Chloe of that type of parenting as a result of that depression or anxiety um, is that she can develop her own um, internalising problems. And so that might be what we're sort of seeing in Chloe um, today in this appointment. Mm. So, um so I'm hearing that you're sort of talking about the importance of attachment and making sure that that's really sort of established and, you know, that there is some 
stuff over time to make sure that uh, that is happening. So it's a bit, bit oh, quick to be sort of leaping to um, conclusions. But, oh, um, you know, do you think there's a, a role for the GP to be going, okay, I've identified, I'm a bit worried about this mum, I need to give someone else, give this to someone else straight away? Or like what sort of, are there any moments where you'd be like, oh, you know, this does need action straight away or you can sit on this for a little while? Yeah, I, look, I think um, I would be inclined to kind of um, try and monitor. Um, I think that um, I definitely need more information. Um, my experience in sort of child protection, uh, you know, there are red flags um, for me here um, in, in this kind of interaction between Chloe and her mum. So, Chloe's um, presentation could be really appropriate. So she's coming into a strange place. Um, so her reluctance to engage with a stranger, which is the GP, um, staying close to her mum, not offering much in terms of interaction, could actually be like a really appropriate, oh, I'm a bit appropriately wary of this situation that I find myself in. Or it could be that it's some emerging signs of post-traumatic stress um, for her. So is her reticence to engage with the doctor is, you know, that could be um, around um, reduced or restricted interests that often accompany trauma, could be around fearfulness, um, lack of reciprocity, um, her scratching of her arm could be a sign of internalising symptomatology or anxiety. Um, I, I think we just would need a little bit more information. So, you know, what's happening for mum, um, what does mum say about Chloe? What sort of language does she use when she talks about Chloe? Um, does mum have any particular worries for Chloe? Who else might be worried about Chloe? What does her daycare say? Um, that kind of stuff. Mm. All of which is very difficult to do in 12 minutes or whatever your appointment <laughs> slot is. This is true. <laughs> this is very true. Yeah. So. Yeah. As a GP, every time I hear that, it's just like I think the, the most important thing is to try and create a relationship where you can have some continuity over time, where you can actually take a bit, get more of a history over time and actually try and identify what the appropriate referral pathway is, whether it's, you know, is it is it offering some parenting supports or courses or that sort of thing, or is it is there some more serious sort of mental health issues that we need to be addressing? Um, it's uh, probably a good time just to talk about normal development, um, what's acceptable and what's not. Mary, did you have any thoughts? Um, I sure do. And what I really liked is um, both of you, or particularly Jess, talked about asking the mum if she's concerned, um, being really aware that a GP appointment is an unusual circumstance for a child and she's two and a half. She's in a really unfamiliar environment. So it's really important that we don't jump to conclusions, but that we do ask mum. Uh, I hear your 12 minutes or however many minutes, Joe, which is tricky and getting them back in the door. So I understand that it's a juggle, but you know, we do need to understand whether this is a one off or whether, you know, like kind of a circumstance or whether it is um, an ongoing thing. So yeah, asking if mum's concerned, but also asking if anyone else has expressed concern to those other people that are close to the family, the neighbours, the grandparents, the daycare, you those other people who um, have interaction with the family. I thought um, if maybe we could look at the next slide, Jo, because we've got um, some numbers up here that are kind of a bit worrying to us. So if we look at children who are what we call late talkers at two, so they're not um, combining words, they're not able to begin to communicate their message at two, we know that that's 19% 19, 19 of children are what we call late talkers. Um, there's been a few studies done, one the Early Language Victoria study which tracked a large number of children down in Melbourne. And um, from that and from a number of other international studies, we see the same kind of pattern where we see that at four, only 5% of children are still impaired. Um, and of the late talkers, 14% of them have now moved and are typically developing. But probably more concerning for me is that there are children who present typically at two. 
So they're on track when they're two. Um, signs are looking good and they go on to look impaired at age four. So they start off quite nicely and whether that usually they plateau, they don't keep moving at the same rate as other children. And when we kind of have a look at some risk and protective factors and um, Jess, Jess and I haven't talked about this honestly, but I feel like Jess has already kind of told us a number of those. Um, so when we look at the protective factors, so the things that will lead us to predict that the outcome for the children will be quite good, the kind of things we look at are the environment, the home language experience. Um, we look at the child's kind of intelligence, so maybe their symbolic play, um, other cognitive indicators. Um, also, if they have good comprehension. And here, as speech pathologists, we'd caution you not to ask the parents, not to rely on the parents saying, oh yes, they understand everything. Because so many of the things that we ask children to do at home, they can predict, they can predict, they can anticipate. You know, they see you getting your car keys, so they know you're going somewhere, so they know to go to the door. So parents aren't always the best people to ask about comprehension. But also looking at the type of vocabulary children use, they might only have a dozen words, but is there a variety in there or are they just using nouns? And finally, what we what we call sensitive parenting or being responsive to the child, again, links quite nicely back to what um, Jess talked about. So they're all our protective factors and risk factors, are um, history of hearing problems, family history of speech, language, or often literacy difficulties, um, both expressive language and receptive language, so talking and comprehension affected, and not using verbs. So they might only have a dozen words, but they might only be nouns. So they can label lots of objects, but they don't use words like go, come, um, run verbs, um, and not using words uh, like descriptive words like yum or yuck or, or those kind of um, descriptive words. Um, so there are kind of risk and protective factors that you'd start to be getting a sense of. So with all of that in mind, Joe, what would you do as the GP? You've now got so much information to think about. I think it comes back to the, the setting that I've got and I would, um, mm. you know, you have to take your cues from what the patient's agenda is. So right now mum's come in because she's worried about skin sores, so making sure that's being addressed, which hopefully is a good way to build um, a relationship and, and offer, um, you know, an opportunity for follow up because usually you'd want to see if that treatment is going to respond. And you can, in all that time, be doing things like assessing all that stuff that you're talking about. So I can observe attachment. I can do that over time. I can observe mood and affect for the mum over time. I can see if, you know, that sort of um, appropriate stuff that you're talking about, Jess, with the with Chloe being a bit, you know, wary of me. Hopefully I would win her over <laughs> and I'd see a difference with the second visit. Um, the, like the... The trick often is just getting that second appointment in and then I think the, the thing that I found really valuable with what you were saying there Mary is um, maybe not like asking mum directly about how she thinks speech and comprehension and stuff are going but saying has anyone else noticed you know has she had any trouble at daycare or all that sort of stuff just to to get that corroborative history without actually having to speak to anybody else is a good way of um, sort of get, looking for a few extra flags uh, and help uh, sort of push along. I guess um, the trick in general practice is that we've been trained, I think, from a, for a very long time to look at maternal mental health as a potential impact on children's development. Um, and I think that there's a possibility that I would go down that pathway specifically and try and maybe even develop a relationship with her and ask about her coming in to see me which you know given the focus of our conversation right now makes me worry that maybe I would miss an opportunity for Chloe so I guess the question like and I don't know who would like to take this one <laughs> um 
you know, chicken or egg, what's the most important thing? Do we work on mum getting to a place where she can feel like she can really work on her attachment and that sort of stuff? Or do we go, okay, there's enough sort of signs here that we need to be thinking proactively about getting some speech assessment and therapy happening? Mm. Well, I think this would be a great chance to throw a poll to the audience oh. as well, because um, I guess it, let's set the scene a little bit and say that with an extra consultation, some risk factors like Mary spoke about were reported, you know, perhaps mum did mention some family history of some learning difficulties. Um, and perhaps, you know, after a couple of sessions with mum, you're still noticing a bit of flat affect that seems to be impacting the interaction between her and Chloe. On your Slido poll, where do, what are people's thinking? Would you refer Chloe to a speech pathologist in that scenario? We'd, we'd be very happy to hear if anyone would like to justify their choice too, if there's, a, yeah. if there's something that would help you swing your decision one way or another. I think that would be quite useful. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So I'm pretty sure there's no right or wrong answer in this instance, really. No. Uh, and, you know, Mary and I would say the same as speech pathologists. Mm. Yeah. So I want I want an option of being it depends. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, we can see overwhelmingly on the poll <laughs> that the majority are kind of saying, yes, I would make that referral. But, you know, we got that 11% for no and unsure. And I think they're really, really valid and considered responses as well. Because, I mean, in preparing for tonight, Mary and I even had a really robust discussion, both as experienced speech pathologists, to say exactly what you were saying, Joe. It is a chicken and egg scenario a bit. I guess when I've been reflecting on it since we were discussing it in the last few days, of course, like I agree that every family situation is going to be unique and you're trying to find that balance, that balance between what's most protective and the choice of least risk for the child, but also what is the capacity of the family and their current state of well-being and how do we balance those things. For me with Chloe, I do err towards the side of if there is um, engagement in mum for a speech pathology referral, I think that would be really, really valuable for Chloe in this scenario. And the things that are kind of making me lean towards that side of the decision making tree is that for Chloe, she's an, at an age at two and a half where she can get referred through the public health system. So she has access to a publicly funded speech pathology service at her age. Now, unfortunately, kids age out of publicly funded services predominantly around the country. So we have this opportunity while she's young. And certainly in our PHN area, children at her age will be prioritised for at least assessment. So I guess I'm thinking if I'm in the GP's shoes and I'm not even sure if Chloe's delayed in her communication skills, uh, you know, other than the considerations around, of course, the time and energy demands on the family, there isn't a lot of risk around referring Chloe to a publicly health funded speech pathology service. I'm also considering for Chloe that what we were talking about earlier, that kids who start school late don't catch up. And so really, if she sits on a waiting list for a little while, she may only be 18 months, two years away from school entry. So there's a window of opportunity to identify any support needs for her and provide the best evidence-based intervention that will best place her for success at school transition. And then my, my other thinking was, we we don't know yet in this scenario, but if there's some bigger diagnosis at play here for Chloe, 
potentially by starting the ball rolling with some assessment in that developmental domain of communication for her at this time, we're equipping her for the pathway into something like the early childhood, early intervention pathway under NDIS, should that be her funded pathway of services into the future. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, you know, a really tricky scenario. Obviously, we're playing with hypotheticals, but I think there's a lot of things to think about in, in weighing up where we go with Chloe. Can I, like, I may not have um, given you much of a heads up on this one, Kate, but I just said, like, as GPs, we've had years of struggle trying to get people into public services. Like, it's a, yeah. it's a trick. And mm -hmm. um, also from your presentation that you guys did earlier, um, you talked about, you know, key terms and um, just knowing, understanding the language to um, use in your referrals. So with Chloe, where it's a little bit, um, it's not, I don't think it's clear at all, really. Like it's it's really, we're just, we want to make sure that she's got the best opportunity to have access to improving her communication language and um, spoken word. But I think um, as GPs, we're kind of get the speech bit, but maybe those other bits are a bit more obscure for us. Like, could you, um, how would you recommend referring, putting that referral through so that we can get, you know, that's flagged enough for them to go, yeah, this is legit, like this is a communication, um, you know, this is worthy of assessment for communication difficulties. Like what would you recommend we pop into our referrals? Mm. So um, Mary, you might want to talk a bit to the work that you did on the speech language communication health pathway that just was reviewed and went live last week for Hunter New England. Um, but prior to that, Mary, I would even just say making sure her age is absolutely flagged because the um, vast majority of our services will prioritise service based on that age between two, two and a half and four years of age to try and capture children at that really developmentally crucial time. But Mary, you might want to talk to the pathway. Too. Yeah, sure. I think um, spot on. One of the other things that I'd want to be um, including in my referral is a note of who's concerned. So if from your conversation, you know, mum said, oh, yeah, I'm a bit concerned or yes, the grandparents have mentioned it or daycare's mentioned it, I would absolutely include that. And I would also include anything you know about family history or hearing difficulties. So I think they would be my key things. Um, so yeah, concern, history of hearing problems and um, family yeah. history. Yeah, and certainly as Kate said, age, uh, because age will be a big flag to any speech pathologist. Age and parent or family concerns, concerned by significant other, other big things that will flag a child. And I guess I was um, thinking about it and Kate highlighted a number of risks to the family in terms of referring them or costs, you know, the time to get to the appointment, the cost of the petrol to get travel to the appointment or the um, public transport costs to get there. In terms of you as GPs, what's the risk to you guys? I honestly can't see any risk to you guys in terms of referring to a speech pathologist. Um, and so as long as it's okay with the family, as long as you are not putting the family at risk, I would suggest that you erred on the side of referring using those couple of key points. Yeah, um, worst case scenario, if they're not, not appropriate or the speech he sees them and says they're fine, um, you've built a relationship with a speech pathologist and, and you'll, you know, you've got some feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So the pathway, um, Mary worked extensively on the pathway over the, the last couple of months. And so, and, or, you know, I know all the GPs um, in the PHM would be familiar with the health pathways. What we've been able to build into the reviewed pathway is actually some drop down boxes to mm. provide that bit of extra information to Joe around some of, I guess, that terminology that um, is 
probably not every day speak for GPs, but can be utilised in that referral letter to the speech pathology service. Um, and I noticed in our questions, we had a question there about, would we be asking about experiences of family and domestic violence in while Chloe's mum was pregnant with her? And we have a bit more of a chat around impacts of complex trauma later tonight, but certainly in the pathway, there's mm -hmm. also some summarised information in one of those drop down boxes in the pathway that shows us and helps us to have those conversations with families so that they do understand that that context of experience of family and domestic violence increases the risk of a child having communication difficulties, even if that's an in utero experience. And I can see Emma's posted a really nice meaty question for us about potentially overburdening the public service. And that's something that um, we certainly talk about a lot in um, WA. I'm sure you guys talk about it all over Australia. And yes, there is a risk of overburdening the public service. But frankly, given that we know that these kids, you know, if they're still having difficulties when they enter school, it's going to overburden systems much later if we don't refer them. So we know that early intervention can be quite effective at helping kids early. Um, and so I wonder if there's more of a risk in not referring them. What do you think, Kate? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously I sit in the Hunter mm. New England Central Coast PHN area and um, in the in speaking with my speech pathology colleagues within the local health district, the feedback from them is that they would actually rather the referral for the two, two and a half year old than to see that same child at six, eight or 10, where the level of disorder is A, more established, but also um, we're then getting those um, extra impacts of that communication disorder showing itself then in behaviour that's leading to, you know, the negative impacts on that child's self-identity and self-esteem, starting to get excluded from environments, reduced participation, family breakdown, poor relationship building. So I completely agree again, this is one of these great public health debates in any country is where do we put our money and communication actually has a really strong evidence base to show that unmet communication disorders in very early life has a huge negative impact on a person's trajectory, but all their, also their service system use across their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, all the later academic, social, employment type risks that I know we're going to talk about a bit more in a minute, um, but they're a greater cost. The other thing I'd suggest is that, um, Kate, you talked about getting them referred later. And unfortunately, if they're referred later, they no longer have access to the free public service. And so then we're in a quandary of we have these kids that we know about, but we can't service them within the public health sector. And we know that it's a burden to the family to access private therapy. Um, but if we get them early, there's lots of creative ways to manage caseloads of early children, you know, younger children. So group therapy, parent training, there's lots and lots of creative ways of managing those caseloads. So I would possibly not worry too much about overburdening the system. Yeah, and I think it's about, um, you know, uh, maybe trying to preserve the public service for those that aren't resourced to be able to afford private services and the people that can access private services, you know, by all means point them in that direction. Um, I think uh, this probably moves quite nicely into our next poll really, Kate, doesn't it? Yes, <laughs> it does perfectly. Um, so if we're looking to get rebates for um, our patients so that they can um, have a smaller gap, hopefully, to see private allied health, um, 
you know, do do we think have we got enough evidence of a developmental um, you know, language problem here to say that this is a chronic condition that we could um say with confidence that we can do a GP management plan? Or maybe I would like, I think it's probably unfair for me to ask that you do that one. But certainly um I would be comfortable over a period of time if I was convinced there was a communication language or um other developmental Can I, concerns. Sorry to yes. interrupt. Oh, the polls just come up on Slido now. Oh, good. So, you got it. So, yep. No worries. Like I said, I think it, it definitely meets the definition of a chronic condition. So if it's present for more than six months, and we need to have confidence as um, clinicians with those diagnoses, and um, you know what would our peers do? And I think again, like I'd be very comfortable going up before Medicare saying you know, how much money I'm saving you right now, if we do this right now. Um, yeah, look, I, I get, I'm going to be speaking to the converted here. Oh, good, I've got some good, we've got some support there from the rest of my colleagues out there. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, that's flagged in the um, communication health pathway as well, that um, there's a drop down box for the um, neurodevelopmental condition, developmental language disorder. And the information there, as outlined in the DSM-5, is that that is actually a lifelong condition. So it, a child who fits the criteria, uh, criteria for that diagnosis absolutely fits the criteria for having a chronic disease. Absolutely. And I think the other thing that we can do is um, families can access both types of services. So they might seek um, some private therapy while they're on the waiting list for a government type service. So they can access both. And I think as a profession, speech pathologists are really good and I know other allied health people are the same, really good at dipping in and out and, and passing families between us. Oh, Emma, nice question. At what age can a child be diagnosed with DLD? I love your question. Um, it, it's a tricky one. When we're looking at DLD, we're really looking at the persistence of the problem. So two and a half is up too young, like we don't know that the problem is persistent yet. We're also looking at significance, how severe they are. And we're also looking at functional impact. When I say functional impact, I mean, how is the communication difficulty impacting on the child's ability to participate um, when they're a bit older, in the playground, in the classroom, interact with their family, their friends. Um, so functional impact. So, you know, if we were to see a child like Chloe at two and a half, I guess um, the, the literature tells us that if we're not sure, we should be um, seeing her again in six months, but we'd really be wanting to build up a, a picture of that persistent significance and functional impact. And also as, I can't remember if it was Joe or Kate alluded to before, just making sure there's nothing else going on. So is it that, that you know, there's some other diagnosis for um, Chloe? So a little bit early to be um, diagnosing her as DLD, probably until she's closer to five, but there isn't a cutoff. You know, I'm not saying you can't diagnose a four and a half year old. Um, I'm saying I'd be much more confident at five. You'd be seeing those features of DLD yeah. right from get go. Yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, for a child who's as young as two and a half, it might be if we do some work with the home environment, build up her range of words, her vocabulary, um, look at the interaction, all those things I talked about as being red flags, um, manage any potential hearing difficulties. It might be that we don't see that persistence. It might be that we can actually treat it and her trajectory kind of catches up. But I would have it in mind, yeah. I would be, yeah, looking out for it at two and a half. Wonderful. Well, I think we've gone from assessment management all the way through to referral. I reckon we might nearly be ready to move on to our next um, yeah. case. Thanks so much for um, your participation, everybody. The questions are fabulous. And yeah, keep them good. coming. Yeah. It's nice for us. We don't want you to leave thinking, oh, I wish they had have talked about. So yeah, keep them coming. So moving on to our next case. Um, 
I think we were we supposed to do a poll beforehand? I think we were. Maybe we've, I might have put that in the wrong order. Um, no, I think that's OK. If you want to um, chat to the case study. Oh, yeah, or do the poll. Either okay, or. Put the poll up. There we go. I want to set yeah. the scene a little bit, get everyone thinking in theme. So mm. what is the co-occurrence of behavioural difficulties and language disorder? Mm. I might just quickly jump in, Jo. Um, yes, please. So just to let everyone know that we are running these polls on Slido. So there may be some people that have joined a little bit later that didn't get these instructions. It's 100% OK. So if you'd like to participate, um, just head to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, and enter our event code, S-L-C-2. Um, and it will just ask for your name. And once you enter that and log in, you'll see the polls pop up and you can participate. Anonymously. So nobody else sees your answer. That's right, yeah. <laughs> That's very lovely. Okay. You happy um, with the answers, Kate? Well, it's interesting again. I love an interactive poll. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love watching, getting that visual feedback. And really interestingly, the vast majority of people are recognising there's some kind of relationship here which is what we need to know. So um, there's some really recent publications, a 2019 review by Kilpatrick and colleagues concluded that over 70% of children who experience emotional and or behavioural issues also demonstrate language impairment. So these things co-occur together at very, very high rates. Um, and that can be both ex uh, externalising and internalising behaviour difficulties. And that's something to really keep in mind because I think um, there is the risk that children with internalising behaviour difficulties fly under the radar a little bit around that developmental lens. Um, and yet they're captured in this data of 70% co-occurrence. Mm, thanks, Kate. All right, I'll, I'll just talk through the discussion. So Brendan um, presented with his stepmum for an appointment in general practice with concerns about his attention and behaviour. Brandon was uh, 12, or was that a 12.2? I don't know if that was <laughs> 12 at the time of the appointment. His stepmother described that she had known Brandon for five years and was sharing a home with him for the past three years. The case history collected from his stepmum indicated that everyone always refers to Brandon as having ADHD although he doesn't have a formal diagnosis. His stepmum reported not knowing the details of Brandon's early life experiences, but knowing that he had been placed in his father's care full time as his mother had a history of allowing violent partners to live in the home with her and her children. Brandon's father had previously shared with her that he suspects Brandon was abused by some of his mother's partners. Brandon's presenting problems are reported as difficulties managing his feelings with violent and aggressive outbursts at home and at school. It is described that Brandon has been suspended twice from school in the past term and he was kicked off his soccer team. Throughout the appointment, Brandon is quiet and sullen. He is reluctant to engage with you and provide single word answers to your questions. Mm. So, you know, I really take my hat off to GPs because I can't um, imagine the pressure of that sense of never knowing what's walking through the door in any given moment. And I think Brandon's probably a great example of that. What strikes me, Joe, is that, again, we don't have a lot of information. So in your position, again, what would you be seeking? What are you asking about and what information are you trying to collect? I'd love to say these are easy, <laughs> easy consults, but they're really not. And I think um, in these initial mm. uh, assessments, I'd be looking for um, major red flags, which are also can be really tricky to sort of pull out without really rupturing rapport and relationships, which is probably actually what I need to focus on in the hope that I might be able to um, establish a connection, you know, most importantly with Brandon, but really, you know, when he's only 12, you need to find the adult in his life that's going to be his advocate. And that is tr tricky, like it looks like their relationship may be, you know, not it's hard to know. There's not enough information there. Is, is his stepmom his go-to? What about his dad? You know, what's going on? Like, who is the person that 
you know, we should be having conversations with. And, you know, ideally it's going to be everybody, but just trying to sort of get a bit of a sense of that. And I think, um, you know, like focusing on his behaviour straight away, I'm sure would be really um, challenging for Brandon. Like that would be a really uncomfortable position for him. So maybe taking the, the focus away from uh, that on the initial um, consult and just working around, you know, is there any medical history I need to know about? You know, have you got any symptoms that may be contributing to a, you know, behavioural difficulties like, you know, could there be hearing problems? Could there be visual problems? Um, you know, you know, while I'm asking those questions, sort of fishing around for some extra signs of any other neurodevelopmental difficulties that it might be having, so sensitivities, you know, um, how he's making friends, all that sort of stuff, just to try and build a better picture um, with the thought very much that this won't be the first time that we'll be meeting and hoping very much that we can have some continuity. Um, yeah, tricky. Uh, you'd want to know too what kind of services is, I think he'd been in contact with already because I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I hope very much that this isn't the first time he's come to um, the attention of a health professional. Mary, I feel like um, <laughs> I feel like this is something that you uh, not Mary. Sorry, I was uh, Jess. You know, Jess, I was sort of thinking about you when I was I was looking at the wrong person. Um, yes, like my immediate thoughts go to you. What what's what are you? What would you think? Yeah. Um, look, I suppose um, trauma and ADHD. <clears throat> are really quite pervasive in childhood and this is like a super common um, thing that comes up uh, for me um, working in the department. Um, uh, I, I guess that um, maltreatment is associated with lots of psychological deficits, deficits in emotional regulation and executive function which are also related to ADHD symptoms. Um, the other kind of really important thing to kind of remember is that um, post-traumatic stress disorder and ADHD are often comorbid. Um, I read a recent study in, in as much as 50% of the sample. Um, so it, it's very, very pervasive. I think the other really important thing that's kind of playing on my mind with this case study is that um, the relationship between um, ADHD and maltreatment can be bidirectional. So um, exposure to maltreatment can exacerbate symptoms of ADHD, but ADHD symptoms can also put a kid at risk um, for harsh parenting. Um, and so uh, for, for Brandon, um, the other thing for me is that he's had a period of um, relative st stability, I guess, or I'm hypothesising that he has in the three years that he's been placed with his current caregiver. So we know that the most powerful predictor of children's recovery from trauma is the, the presence of that one stable, safe, secure, predictable person. So I'm wondering a little bit more about what is actually happening for him at home and how his parents are currently coping um, with his behavioural presentation. Um, I definitely think that he needs um, intervention. Um, and I uh, agree with you, Joe. I'd want further information um, just from the different people in his world about what his symptoms are. Um, but given that his access to school has been impacted, it's really quite clear to me that um, he does need assistance. Um, what's interesting for me is that um, her stepmom is really worried about ADHD for Brandon, but perhaps less clear about the impact of the trauma on him. Um, and I can really clearly see that there's some um, symptoms of trauma here. So he has intrusion symptomatology, um, so difficulties focusing and attending, poor concentration. Those things actually might be due to his hypervigilance and re-experiencing of trauma rather than ADHD as such. Um, the avoidance symptomatology in post-traumatic stress could be around um, him feeling really inadequate in social situations, having poor social, poor self-esteem. Um, and so that's kind of manifesting in that way. Um, the fighting and the violence in the aggression could be about um, that he's only ever really had exposure to interactions that have been marred by violence. Um, and so that could be what's actually happening for him there. Um, 
I think it's kind of important when we're talking about adolescents and how we actually going to engage him in any kind of therapy. Um, so be thinking about, is he actually willing to participate? Um, what can we offer his parents? Um, you know, can he actually attend and concentrate? Does he actually need some um, pharmacological assistance in that regard? Um, that kind of stuff. Um, I'd also want to really think long and hard about his speech um, and language skills because obviously that's a really big barrier to a kid being able to meaningfully engage um, in uh, therapy with a psychologist. Um, Kate, what do you reckon about that one? Oh, Jess, what a segue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you would think we'd practised, hey? <laughs> yeah. The um, Well, I mean, obviously, sitting here as a speech pathologist with an interest in complex trauma, my mind, of course, goes completely to wondering about Brandon's communication skills. Mm -hmm. But, of course, there's only one piece of, you know, a, a bigger puzzle of what Brandon's support needs are in any given moment. But... I think we've already got that important data from that last poll that was kind of saying to us, flagging with us, when we see behaviour, think language. When we know there's a 70% co-occurrence of behaviour difficulties with language disorder, we need to be thinking language when we're getting reports of behaviour difficulties. But I think there's a bit more here to unpack. So if it's okay, Charles, if we launch the next poll that's around the incidence of communication difficulties when a child has experienced complex trauma. So it'll be the next oh, sorry. slide, I think. Yeah, thanks, Drew. So if we have a look at um, this one. <clears throat> Pardon me. And while you're while people are doing that, mm. Kate, do you mind if I just add in that we have a, a really extreme case here? You know, we don't have your run of the mill case. And it's important to think about the link between language and behaviour, even in cases that are less extreme. Mm. So, you know, if a parent talks to you about a child who's always getting in trouble at school without all the other associated things, keep language in mind. Um, I don't, you know, for, for otherwise fairly typically developing kids, they don't tend to be naughty for no reason. So I always wonder with behaviour, why? Why are you acting in that way? What has led you to act in that way? And it can be their comprehension you know, that maybe they haven't understood a word. Uh, maybe they don't understand the social rules in the playground and how to join in. And so their way of managing some conflict is to hit somebody or push somebody. So, you know, it's good that we're talking about an extreme case here, but don't put communication aside and go, let's not worry about it except with these extreme cases. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree, Mary. Um, so if we have a look at people's response to this poll, overwhelmingly the majority are thinking it it does co-occur, it, it does have a big impact and co-occurs co at high numbers. And that's exactly right. It's what the data and the research tells us. Now, it's fair to say there is a bit of variability in the um, published research, and that's really around... Um, what was included in the research study, some of those same psychometrics that hold for any research, who was um, delivering the um, tool that was being used, because there are there is some published research where it's not speech pathologists doing the assessment. Um, however, all of the data clusters at over 60%. So um, there's a very recent publication of Australian data, a 2020 publication by Snow, McLean and Federico, which um, looked at the language and literacy skills of teenagers living in out of home care in Victoria. And what it identified was that 92% of the cohort of teenagers in that study scored below the expected range for their age on formal language assessment and 100% 
scored below the expected range for literacy. So we're talking really, really huge numbers. And to add a bit of weight to that, those numbers as well, there's a really significant met, uh, published meta-analysis that reviewed 40 years worth of publications across this relationship between maltreatment and subsequent communication skill development. And that's Silvestre and colleagues, and it was published in 2015. And it found that the bottom line of that review was that the language skills of children who are abused and or neglected are delayed compared to their peers. But I think really significantly to take from this publication is that age matters. So the younger the child was at the time they experienced neglect and or abuse, the bigger the impact that has on their subsequent language skill development. And then there is some more um, Australian data that from 2014 that shows that 88% of children who've experienced abuse or neglect require speech pathology intervention. And I can speak personally to this topic, having sat in Newcastle in a trauma treatment service. So we were working specifically with children living in out of home care. And we were keeping data on the speech pathology um, service with those young people. And we always tracked above 80% of the young people through the service required intervention around one area of at least of their communication skills, be that language, their social communication skills, their speech sound and subsequent literacy. Um, so we are talking really high numbers. So, um, and actually, Joe, if you can show the next slide, I think this kind of just drives home something that for me has almost become my guiding mantra. And that is that 2020 publication, the authors felt so confident in the outcomes of that to be able to say this really powerful quote, language disorders are so common in this population as to be almost normative. So for me, what I kind of hear a story like Brandon's in that consult case study, and straight away, I'm mindful that there's two really significant flags here that it's highly likely that he has a previously undiagnosed communication disorder. And they are the fact that we've got the behaviour of difficulties and he has that case history of complex trauma experienced in childhood. Now, obviously, we don't know all the details about that, but we're seeing those two co-occurring things that are really big red flags, that this is a very real possibility for him. And then I guess as Jess was saying, um, one of my, my individual learnings in working in that trauma treatment service was that for young people, obviously we're trying to look at um, all services around them building protective factors in that young person's life and supporting them to build protective factors in their life. So protective against um, future mental illness, protective against family and placement instability, protective against unemployment and contact with the criminal justice system. And what that means for me as a speech pathologist is that if we don't know if Brandon has a language disorder, how can we ensure that services he gets access to can be maximally effective? So just as Jess was kind of saying, she, you know, she feels that Brandon needs to work with a mental health clinician. But if that's going to be a talking based therapy, how can that then be um, as effective as possible if we don't know what his language skills and support needs are. So I think there's um, into the future, there's a real space and discussion to be had around the role of speech pathology in working with other professionals around a child who has communication difficulties. 
Yeah, I can, like, I think we've talked about this a bit before, Kate, but like there's so many really young adolescents, that um, young people that I see at Headspace that have presenting, um, you know, they've been referred or they're presenting because they can identify that they're anxious or that there may be some behavioural problems or there's some question about ADHD. And so many of them, I'm sure there is a, an element, if if maybe not all of the presentation, but like there's definitely going to be some, there's some communication developmental um, concerns there um, and often a trauma history as well. Um, but it's, I don't think it's a well-established referral pathway, especially at this age. I feel like, you know, it gets lost. It's right down the bottom. Um, so I think it's been particularly useful meeting all you guys um, uh, and Jess in particular to say, hear you say that I can't really do my therapy if we can't address the communication therapies that we go. And I, that thing that really rings quite true for some of the kids that we've tried to do some psychological um referrals for and it's just it, it misses the mark you know it's, they're just not connecting the way they would with a, a child that has normal development um communication and speech so and language uh yeah, yeah. so uh i think there's a huge huge gap yeah. to be honest oh there is and there's this um great question that's just coming from emma so emma's um asking about how effective is speech pathology intervention for children of this age and this type of presentation. And actually, Emma, I would say um, there is the potential to be highly effective. Highly effective in a number of ways. So, and I think Mary would have some great opinions on this too as she comes back in. But um, first of all, there are certainly a range of compensatory strategies that can be put in place. So if we think about the ICF modelling, we may not always be targeting our speech pathology intervention with an older child at that activity level. And an example of that is nearly every young person I met in the trauma treatment service was illiterate. And if they were teenagers, we may not focus the time and effort on going back to synthetic phonics instruction and working at learning sounds and blending words, but we might actually use assistive technology to allow that child to be able to participate in the activities they want and need to be able to do. So I think there's a huge amount of value in the compensatory supports a speech pathologist can offer a young person. I would also say that I think, and you know, Jess, you might talk more to this as well, but um, so many young people expressed to me what a relief it was for them to actually understand why they were having difficulty and why they had always had difficulty with different activities across their life. So it wasn't unusual for um, teenagers to say to me things like, I don't understand you know, why people like school, because I can never keep up with what the teacher's talking about. And for me to be able to go through an assessment process with them and help them to understand that there's a neurodevelopmental difference in their brain that we can work with brought a lot of relief. Do you think that's an accurate description, Jess? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I can think of a couple of kids that I worked with um, and one sort of very extreme example of a, a young person who was very disenfranchised from just about everything and had joined an extremist group. Um, and what Mary was sort of talking to um, before is that there is a reason for every behaviour and the predominant reason for him becoming disenfranchised and and you know, engaging with this extremist group that got him in quite a bit of trouble was his poor communication skills. Um, and those poor communication skills meant that he couldn't access school properly, couldn't engage with friends very well. So, yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's, it's so important. And once that intervention was put in place for him, there was such an, a lovely shift. Mm. So, yeah. And, and I guess just um, my last little point, not to hold the conversation on that question too much, but um, for a young person, be them a teenager with, you know, uh, what we might call a difficult um, 
presentation in terms of their behaviour support needs, if they're motivated and they're engaged, I've actually made fantastic progress towards goals with young people. And I think the skill of that is finding providers who are trauma-informed, who um, understand some of the tools of the trade of engagement with young people and are willing to be flexible and I guess recognise that having a balance of um, goals around what that child wants to do as well as what that child needs to do can sometimes be a recipe for success for engaging a young person in an intervention that can be hugely successful for them. Mm. That's great to hear, Kate. So uh, how, how do we get to access a speech pathologist for this age group? Yeah, really tricky. And I'm not going to pretend that there's not an elephant in the room here because as Mary was talking about earlier, kids age out of the public health system in regards to speech pathology services. So... Um, I've been really thinking about how I have supported older children. And we're not talking old, like for a lot of our community health services, children above five years of age, maybe above seven years of age, can only get an assessment. But sometimes the waiting list for that assessment um, just prohibits that being a viable option in the context, really. So what I would suggest is that um, it is really different across different um, parts of the state. That's been one of my learnings. So obviously you will have families, what we talked about before, who may be able to financially manage the gap with a GP management plan to access a private service. I think the trick for that um, is about families understanding why they might want to prioritise that expenditure in their life and what the potential benefit of a diagnosis around understanding these support needs could be for them and the young person. I think um, for children in out-of-home care, certainly GPs can document the need for speech pathology services and those, the cost of those can be covered in the child's case plan. So that's something that um, isn't really well known, but it was the pathway for ongoing intervention for a lot of young people that I've worked with in out-of-home care. Of course, some, pe some of the young people we work with may have other diagnoses or areas of developmental support needs that enable them access to the NDIS. So that's a potential pathway, um, not at you know, surface level, not looking like that for Brandon. Some schools in New South Wales actually partner with New South Wales Health or utilise localised funding to purchase in speech pathology services. It's really hit and miss. So it's about knowing your local area. And likewise, some Aboriginal medical and community support services purchase in or employ speech pathologists to work with the young people who access their service. So, you hey, know. Can I interrupt? Of course. Sorry, I, yeah. I, I don't know. We have a storm here and it's clearly interfered with my team. So I'm so sorry. I've logged on to a different computer. Um, we've done some work not with kids with um, specifically language difficulties, but um, young people with dyslexia and we've talked we've interviewed both their families but and their teachers but we've also interviewed the children themselves and the resounding message is having a diagnosis is is positive even if i can't get intervention the children was i still call them children they were in that transition period between um, primary and high school so kind of 10 12 kind of years of age the pro the resounding message from them was now i know what's wrong with me i'm not thick and that's their word not mine i'm not thick or i'm not stupid there's a name for why i'm not managing 
and the same for the parents. And the parents found it was really powerful for them to be able to go on and advocate for their child. So to be able to advocate with, you know, whether it be the soccer coach that, you know, it's my child's language that means he doesn't understand about conflict, um, the teacher, the principal, the whoever it might be in the child's life, but mm. that having a diagnosis is really powerful for mm. the individual and the the um, family. So don't be thinking, oh, even with a chronic disease plan, I can only access them a handful of um, appointments and so what? What difference will it make? I, I would suggest that we don't have the right to make that decision we should let the families decide because it can make a big difference mm. yeah 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 empowering them to make that decision mm. you know you don't know what you don't know so they've got to be mm-hmm. yeah. we don't walk in their shoes do we no yeah great well that's very good now, i'm just conscious of the time and I'm, I'm kate do you think we have do we need to do the extra polls or should we just do a bit of reflecting do you think I think if we do this this poll, mm-hmm. I think that will be um, just a really helpful piece of information for people on the back end of the discussion of a young person like Brandon. But then I think we don't have to worry about the last one, just a bit of a reflection. Hmm. So is there a clinical relationship between speech, language and communication disorders and mental health disorders? feel like we really yeah. <laughs> good <right>? we've, we've <laughs> really alluded to it haven't we <laughs> yeah, actually no. but you know what interestingly I didn't know this as a graduating speech pathologist no. no yes and I would agree we were talking about that weren't we yeah yeah it, this has been part of my professional learning across my career so I mean yes as everyone has indicated in their poll there absolutely is and I think you know, it's just an important thing to have in your mind when you've got a preteen or a teen who is coming for a consultation. And, you know, you may be getting a sense that there's some emotional, behavioural disturbances and support needs. Um, the research tells us, and if you're interested in reading more, Origin, the Centre for Excellence for Youth Mental Health, provide a brilliant fact sheet that actually summarises the relationship between adolescent um, mental health disorders and speech language communication needs. Um, And what it talks about is this two-way relationship. So research tells us that children, um, an adolescent who had a speech language or communication need in their childhood is more likely to develop a mental illness in adolescence. Yeah. So there is that, you know, relationship there. But also we know then that mental health disorders have an impact on people's communication skills as well, particularly in the acute phases of unwellness. So, um, you know, there's this really complex relationship there. But again, to me it shows us there is um, an opportunity to put a protective factor in place around a young person who is at risk or a high risk of poor mental health into adolescence if we can identify those flags for communication disorder in childhood and link them with a service wherever possible. Wonderful. Absolutely, and provide them with some strategies. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm going to ask our panellists, they've got they've got one sentence and they've got to tell us what they hope um, our health professionals that have attended tonight um, take away from tonight. So, uh, Kate, I'm dropping you in at first. Okay. Mm. One sentence is hard for me, but my <laughs> hope is that we build an, a medical and allied health workforce into the future that when they meet young people who've experienced complex trauma and adverse childhood experiences are thinking about referral to speech pathology. Great. Thanks, Kate. What about you, Jess? 
Um, I think for me, um, it's really important to um, ask the question about trauma. Does it is it in that person's world? Does it, it has it happened to them? Um, because that's really the only way we're going to get a really clear picture of what's happening for them, a better understanding of what their risk and protective factors are, and then the best way to support them moving forward. Fantastic. Uh, Mary, what's yours? So I'm going to go to slightly earlier in the presentation and remind people to consider or to use the referral pathway. Hopefully there's some helpful information in there. Um, but to consider a referral for younger children, um, don't be, don't fall into the trap of thinking they'll grow out of it, they'll catch up, because we know that often isn't the case. So consider referral early, of course, remembering that the family is a package and remembering the cost to the family as well. Okay, and I think mine is that um, we have uh, a, a real opportunity and potential to um, help alter a child's trajectory if we can help um, pick up difficulties early and refer for intervention. So really important role and that we can actually make a bit of a difference if we can get that kid to the right place. I think you underestimate that, Jo. I should a tell it <laughs> of a difference. You guys have the potential in all your interactions to make a significant difference in a child and family's life. Yeah, fabulous. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I think we've covered our um, objectives pretty well tonight. So we've got a really good idea of the roles that um, different medical and adult health professionals can have in a child's life and in, in particular, of course, the importance of speech pathology referral. Definitely got that anchored in. Um, and I think we've got a really good understanding of um, the impacts untreated speech language and communication difficulties can have across all areas of development. And uh, I think that there's no way anyone could leave today without understanding um, the high incidence of speech language and communication difficulties children in um, children that have experienced family and domestic violence. Mm. So thank you very much to all of the panellists. It's been very appreciated. And of course, all of our participants. It's been um, wonderful to have your participation.